Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Tuesday, February 15th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined here in our virtual studio by two special guests today who are here to bring us up to speed on what's going on in the, in the business community around Vermont. Uh, really pleased to have back on the show Betsy Bishop, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont uh, Chamber of Commerce, the State Chamber. Betsy, good to see you again. Hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure. Also good to have back in the studio, Matt Harrington, who is the Executive Director of the Southwestern Vermont uh, Chamber of Commerce, of course, based uh, down here in Bennington County. Matt, good to see you again. Hi, Andrew, good to see you. Anyway, uh, thank you both for uh, making the time for this conversation. Um, and I guess I thought we might start off, uh, Betsy, by asking you, uh, uh, about what uh, some of the activity that's going on up in Montpelier right now that uh, the chamber is following. One of the, the big issues for Montpelier, as it has been for the last couple of years, is the influx of federal dollars that the state is getting and how best to deploy them to address both short-term and long-term needs. Uh, we've been doing that now for a couple of years, and this year, from the business community standpoint, as it has been for the past couple of years, the number one issue is the labor shortage. What are we gonna do about the workforce? Where did all the workers go? Why are we missing 10,000 people from the workforce, and how do we get them back or find new people? And so that is our number one issue as far as uh, helping businesses go across the state, but also under the Golden Dome and working on policy. The legislature is looking at what they can do on workforce. And, you know, our pitch to some extent is th this is not necessarily just a policy issue. We have a, a much broader issue. We need more people in Vermont. And it's hard to manufacture them or pass a law to say, oh, here's more people. So uh, what we're looking at is how we make sure that we get anybody who is in Vermont who might be on the sidelines currently and not in the workforce, how we can help get them into the workforce. So in some places that's like training funding or second chance hiring or helping employers understand what they need to do with uh, to attract a diverse workforce. So all of those pieces are in play and we can talk in detail about any of those, uh, any of those issues as well. All right, uh, and I'm sure we will. Uh, but meanwhile, over to you, Matt. Uh, what are you seeing from down here in this corner of the state in terms of issues that matter to your members and uh, businesses here down in, in Bennington County? Yeah, uh, well, I, I would agree with Betsy with uh, the amount of action that's going on up in the state house, and, and it is trickling down to our main streets as well. I think people are paying a lot of attention for the massive amount of, of funds that have already come to Vermont uh, and, and look like they'll continue to come to Vermont, and then how the government is going to kind of disperse those. And I know Betsy will speak to, to some of those. Uh, it's, it's very exciting time, I think, for Vermont. It's transformative. Uh, and I think uh, our businesses are feeling some of that or noticing some of that. We, we recently did a poll with our members uh, and 84% and of businesses were optimistic or very optimistic about this year. I, I was quite surprised. We just did the poll. It's winter in Vermont. Uh, we tend to be a little depressed. Uh, we just got over the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, I expected those numbers to be a lot lower, um, but, but I shouldn't be surprised because uh, small businesses in Vermont really have this kind of great DNA for making it through the winter, being optimistic about the future. Uh, I would say a lot of our Main Street mom and pop shops are um, interested and excited about 2022 and, and will need help from uh, the government and the funding that is coming though. Yeah, I might add to that, if you don't mind, Andrew. Um, over the last two years, the legislature has deployed $330 million to businesses in Vermont to help them power through. Uh, that's been based on, you know, looking at their financials and lost need. There's about $26 million more that needs to be deployed. Uh, the governor's team came in and suggested redeploying that to another area. We fought back on that. And I think we're getting toward a path now to make sure that that money gets out to those businesses. Because like Matt says, you know, they're, they're innovative. They've been hanging on for two years. They're, they're doing what they can. But that government help has been promised to them. And it's something that we're fighting for. 
I mean, I, I find myself wondering, are there, are there certain kinds of businesses and, and restaurants seem to be one that come to, come to mind readily that are um, still very much in need of some kind of help from the government uh, in some way or another, uh, just to kind of get over this final hump uh, and hurdle until we can sort of get back to, uh, I hesitate to use the word normal, but uh, uh, something that might have been recognizable, let's say in 2019. <laughs> yeah, I think restaurants are really, um the focus here, uh, as are several other sort of retail Main Street type businesses. Consumer facing businesses have been hit the hardest. So in our world, I think we think about that as the restaurant. We certainly think about that as the retail operation. Um, you might also think about it as the grocery store. Again, customer facing retail having to operate throughout the entire pandemic. No luxury of being able to work from home. And then I would also put hospitals and healthcare in there as well. And those those folks, um, you know, the, the burnout is leading to uh, the workforce shortage. But, you know, when we think about the restaurants, there's so much happening at that space. You know, it's one business that you cannot go to and stay masked. You have to eat and drink when you're at a restaurant by the nature of that. So there's a lot of, um, lot of change in that industry and a lot of uh, tension and, and pressure points there. Um, Last year, uh, we fought pretty hard at the federal level to get the Restaurant Revitalization Fund passed. That was passed. Some restaurants in Vermont were um, able to avail themselves of that. But through that process, there's still in Vermont um, over 500 restaurants in need of $120 million to fill that need. So we are working with our congressional delegation to really fight to get that revitalization fund refilled at the federal level. Yeah, and, and I would add to uh, Bets, you know, that kind of, uh, we had the pandemic, uh, we, our restaurants did some pretty innovative things during that pandemic. Um, and then it, I think when I talk to many of our restaurant owners, then they feel like they got hit with inflation, supply chain issues, staffing issues. And then we even have to add in there and, and this kind of nuance, but children in school getting uh, COVID, so therefore the, the waitress, the cook, uh, the bartender has to stay home with their children as well. And so, you know, I, fee I think part of them, they are coming out of that, that um, the, the general bigger pandemic, but they're, then they have this whole mountain. And I think it goes beyond the restaurants, but I think we feel it most acutely with the restaurants. You know, pizzas will have to go up. Uh, uh, you know, chicken will have to go up. Meat will go up. Um, at, at our local uh, restaurants because they're paying a premium. Uh, I know some places that got completely rid of their uh, chicken wing night uh, because <laughs> chicken wings were like $2 a piece, uh, which, you know, if many of us remember, they, they can go, you know, 50 cents, 25 cents. But then at one point uh, recently, chicken wings were expensive too. So we're, we're, we're seeing that at a micro level too at our restaurants. I wanted to uh, explore that workforce shortage uh, we've both been talking about. Uh, I mean, I heard you say 10,000 workers that are missing. I've, I've seen numbers even higher than that, 23, 24,000 fewer workers in the Vermont state workforce than was the case pre-pandemic. And of course, the question is, where are, where do all those folks go? I mean, obviously, some had to uh, stay at home and uh, watch the kids or perhaps a, an elderly parent, uh, grandparents. So let's, let's, I'm going to just round the, the numbers change every week. So, but I'm just going to give some general numbers. So if you think about it, pre-pandemic, we traditionally had like maybe 10,000 people uh, that were, uh, you know, in considered part of labor participation, but not working yet, right? So um, those are people looking for work. That number at the height of the pandemic got to 30,000. Okay, and now we're somewhere around 20,000 because people have come back into the workforce. But there's a gap there, and that gap of those 10,000 workers and where did they go, there's not a lot of, you know, very specific scientific information to answer the question, where did they go? But, you know, our Department of Labor economist has uh, some early evidence to suggest that about a third of those people have retired from the workforce 
never to return. So these are people who, you know, might have like stuck it out for another five or six years if, if you know, depending on their age, like oh, I'm going to work well into my 60s or my 70s. But due to the pandemic and the changes that came with that, they decided at that moment, like, you know what, I'm done. And so some people have retired and are unlikely going to return to the workforce in a full-time capacity. Our hope is to work with mature workers to try to get them back into the workforce in whatever way that that works, you know, so that could be in a part time capacity. And I think that's something that employers need to figure out and adapt to as well. Um, but that's a part of it. But there's also a part of it where um, as humans, we're all assessing, you know, during the pandemic, what what are we doing with our lives? And sometimes if you were laid off or your the business closed that you were working at and you found yourself with some free time, maybe, maybe you were collecting unemployment and during that time you had the moment to sort of assess, what am I doing? Do I want to go back to that job when that place reopens? Do I want to go back to school? Maybe I want to move back home where I came from. There's a lot of differing reasons, and I don't think we'll ever really know the answer, but that's why we're focused on not only trying to get everybody in Vermont who's not working to be working that wants to, but also to be recruiting people from away, encouraging people to understand that you can come and visit here for a long weekend, and but you could also like live here. And yes, in some instances, we've seen that where people are bringing their jobs with them in a remote fashion. But we also want people just to move here so that we can hire them as well in Vermont businesses. And, you know, there's been an effort to relocate people and to incent them to come and we've been working on that. Um, but we also need to have a robust and sustained marketing effort to tell people not only to visit here, but to come live here that we want them here. And I know, Matt, that's been an effort that you've been deeply involved in uh, even before the pandemic arrived. Yeah, right. Well, and I was going to add to what Betsy said, you know, as, mu as many as there are Vermonters who had that moment where they could take a breath and realize what they really wanted to do, the rest of America had that moment too. And we even saw that uh, in the surge of, of kind of 2020, 2021, where our housing market, you know, got up into to the 30 percentile of of new people moving here. Uh, so as, as many of the uh, Vermonters that, you know, decide to retire or go to maybe someplace warmer, we had uh, a lot of people interested and continuing to be interested in this little state of Vermont, which is exciting and something that, as you mentioned, Andrew, uh, we, we started doing before the pandemic. And I know Betsy and her team at the Vermont Futures Project also had been doing a lot of number crunching around we needed 10,000 more people in the workplace before the pandemic. Uh, we were short of workers in Vermont in 2018, 16, you know, down through. So we've been kind of working with this and dealing with this challenge for years now. And, uh, and, and a silver lining of some of what's going on with the pandemic and especially around funding is because there is so much money coming to Vermont. Uh, we may be able to supercharge some of these efforts that we've been doing for quite some time. Some of the things I'm looking at would be around the state of state program, which invites people, as Betsy said, come out for a weekend, test drive Vermont if it's a place you love and you could imagine yourself living here for a lifetime. You know, what are the concierge services that a chamber or, or, or a regional partner can do to uh, make your visit welcoming, connect you with a realtor, connect you with a daycare or uh, a school or even an employer. Uh, and so that's uh, we're going to see some um, we're going to see some supercharging of that effort. I know from uh, just locally with the chamber uh, in southwestern Vermont, uh, we have turned our young professional group into its own organization in anticipation of needing groups that are welcoming because we you know once we get them here they have to stay here one of the best ways we can build roots right here in Vermont is through some of these nonprofit uh, and and supportive organizations uh, young professionals cultural uh, organizations theaters um, rotaries things like that that they actually create the fabric the, uh, the fabric of Vermont so uh, we're we're working with our young professional group to uh, kind of create more of that welcoming environment. And, and on the back end of that, we have our Vermont uh, Welcome Wagon Project, which is once they move here uh, in, in kind of parallel or partnership with the Young Professional Group, you know, how do we keep them here? And part of that is simply 
connecting them with other Vermonters. We all remember that time that we moved to a new place and we didn't know the plumber to call. We didn't know who to call to shovel our driveway for us uh, or the right mechanic. Uh, well, the Vermont uh, Welcome Wagon is part of that, where we just partner uh, you know, people that have lived in Vermont for quite some time with new people that moved to Vermont and hopefully they you know, take them out for a coffee, meet on a Zoom call, uh, get them to join their local croquet league, uh, and also give them some tips on, on living in Vermont as well. So yeah, we're going to see um, some uh, growth in all those kind of different sectors, but the most, uh, most that we're going to see, and I know Betsy can speak to this a little bit more, will be around that retention and relocation effort. Um, stay to stay is one example of that. Yeah, that, you know, bringing new people to Vermont uh, seems to then beg the question of where are they going to live and, and the housing situation. How many, how, how do we work our way out of that? I mean, uh, it speaks well, to that whole labor shortage question of uh, carpenters and plumbers and electricians and people to build these houses as well as just getting them done. Like many of our problems, they're chronic and they're not new, but they've been exacerbated by COVID. And so the answer to the housing question is time and money, <laughs> like so many, so many other things, right? Um, even if you get a huge influx of money, which we did, uh, it does take time to build those. Um, you know, Vermont has been really focused on pouring more money for housing uh, to help the, the homeless population. Um, and to help the low income or affordable housing. Those have been good projects, weatherization. We've been pouring money into those projects, making progress. The, the list is very long there. What we've been adding to that conversation is that we also need to build in what we call sort of the missing middle income housing, that workforce housing. The people who we're trying to hire, those 10,000 people we need more of, or more than 10,000 people, they need to live somewhere and they don't necessarily want what's necessarily available on the market because much of our housing is in, in dire need of upgrading. So, you know, they, they want something Thing that maybe Vermont's not known for, right? It doesn't have to be a single family home with, you know, an acre of land or 10 acres of land. That might not be everybody's cup of tea. It's mine, but that doesn't mean that it's everybody's. And so we need to think about building more and more, you know, yes, single family homes, but townhomes, apartment buildings, one bedroom condos, two bedroom condos, those types of things. It's just not a lot of that in Vermont. We've been really pushing for that. The governor put $5 million in his budget proposal for that missing middle income housing, and the House has already taken that out. Um, I, I cannot understand that. I think their, their reason was, well, the program doesn't feel fully baked. Put the money in, and we will bake that program. There's plenty of good proposals around that. So we're, we're fighting hard for that. But back to like... A lot of people I hear is like, well, we shouldn't be recruiting these people here until we have housing for them. I couldn't disagree more with that. Yes, that would be the perfect thing. But then somebody would be saying, oh, well, we have too many houses with nobody in it. We can do more than one thing at a time. We can invest in housing and build housing and recruit people to live here. We can do more than one thing. And we absolutely have to. Says, says the chamber director who, who does a lot of things. Um, but yeah, with, with what Betsy's saying, you know, I think on a local level, look at the, the growth we've seen in Bennington, uh, specific to uh, housing around the Putnam block. Um, I know there are multiple other developments being developed. Um, one of those on the Tuttle lot um, are partnerships with uh, places like Shires Housing, where uh, we're finding kind of uh, ingenuity around mixed use. So it can partner with uh, uh, kind of a low income model. It can have mid range model. It can ha have high range model and, and the anchor tenant can be a restaurant or the anchor tenant can be an innovation box or the anchor tenant can be that. And so when we look at places like the Putnam block or in Bennington, again, we'll be looking at the Energizer building, you know, this massive building that, that used to do um, all the battery work. Uh, now it sits kind of mothballed. Um, the hope there is that we can make a multi-use there, which, which 
you know, I think some of the effort around Vermont is how do we not have so much sprawl where everybody wants that, you know, four acre piece of land out there, but really what we're finding with some of the younger generation too is moving back downtown. How do we really, again, supercharge our, our downtowns with cell phone service, uh, fiber, um, and the housing stock uh, that, that, you know, somebody doing remote work or coming from New York City because they moved have these expectations of living downtown and living in a, in a condo downtown. I think Vermont has the capacity to do that. And we see some of those um, kind of those, those glimmers of that happening right now in places like Bennington. And I know Manchester's doing some work up in on Depot street as well. So it's hopeful. That Energizer building is a prime example of, you know, I, I can remember having been there a number of times and you kind of scratch your head about it, be it where it's located and, and that, and that's just history. But here's an opportunity, right? A really huge opportunity. And, and one of the things that we've been encouraging is, you know, around Act 250 and building things in this state is sometimes difficult. And we have been encouraging them to lift certain Act 250 restrictions for buildings just like that, so that we already have a density issue in downtown Bennington. You already have that, you want that. The infrastructure is there, the sewer is there, the traffic is there. You want that activity to happen there as opposed to out in the hinterlands. So allow that to happen. It's already a designated downtown. If we've already been through these designations as our downtowns, we should release um, the ability to have these these triggers on on building housing. So we're working on on that with Act 250, not to release the environmental impact or the aesthetic or any of those different criteria, but to allow that housing to happen. The other thing that we're working on is we're anticipating in three or four years that we're going to see sort of a glut of commercial real estate in our downtowns, where a lot of people who have been working from home, uh, that that might continue and so people might still need their building but maybe not as much of a footprint and so we've been encouraging uh, some uh, Act 250 regulation and financial incentives for the conversion of commercial real estate into residential real estate again because where that commercial real estate is is in that walkable downtown with that infrastructure already is this uh, likely to happen uh, that uh that this new process will be uh, put in place? I've been doing this job for a number of years and streamlining the Act 250 process, making it simple so people can use their money quickly and invest um, has been always on my radar screen. And um, this year is no different. Um, and I think my greatest hope for this year is thinking about it as it relates to housing, maybe tackling the whole thing, streamlining the whole process, getting it all done is too much. I think the real pinch point for us right now is housing. So if we can address the permitting process at both the local and the state level to think about how we can allow for more housing to be built in these designated growth areas like downtowns, like growth centers, that's where we should focus our attention is let's do a little piece of that and show that it can work and still be Vermont style. Uh, a, a perennial subject of conversation seems to be how much money the states invests, the state invests in its uh, tourism uh, promotion budget uh, for a state that uh, relies so heavily on tourism and, uh, you know, people coming to the state, uh, we seem to spend very little compared to other states. Well, yes, I think we both should talk about it, but Matt is the chair of the Travel Recreation Council and um, has a really important position to have input to this. I don't know, Matt, do you want me to frame the dollars and then you talk about the... Sure. Is yeah. that, would that be helpful? So um, the $3.5 million is the state's tourism budget every year. Of that, $2 million is spent on marketing. So when you say it's been a small amount, we would agree. And also that $3.5 million has been consistent for many, many years. But there is a several proposals for new dollars coming into the state. There's a special project uh, from EDA funding of about $10 million that is coming to the state. That's over a three-year period of time. And so I think that that will be a robust 
effort, and we're really looking forward to seeing how uh, that gets deployed over three years. Uh, and then there is another marketing push to um, coordinate both tourism marketing and recruiting people to live here marketing. So th that kind of coordinated approach also. Yes, all those things that Betsy said. I, I should mention, uh, I am the former chair. I just uh, got relieved of my of my position because Amy Spear uh, with the Vermont Chamber is now the new chair. So um, I want to give my my partner Amy uh, a shout out there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I think my my plug is always um, to your point earlier, Andrew. Uh, you know, you can't go anywhere else in the country. Uh, and mention your state and have it have the same resounding emotion uh, that we have seen, I mean, everywhere I go. When I say I'm from Vermont or we're doing a travel show in Connecticut or New York or New Jersey, it is just magical to people, uh, unlike other states. And, and when I do our state-to-state -state call with people, they call in from around the country. Uh, one of the things, one of the slides I go through is kind of the amount and the level of brands that we recognize that come from one of the smallest states in the country. And we think of Bernie, we think of Bernie's mittens, uh, we think of Cabot cheese, we think of maple syrup, we think of Burton snowboards, we think of Orvis fly fishing, we think of darn tough socks. It's quite amazing um, for a state that hasn't always been so supportive of its businesses to have the amount of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and you could keep going to have a state so small uh, and yet have such a, uh, an iconic brand, and so one, let's leverage that. You know, I mean, uh, let's let's double down, let's triple down, and I think that that's what Betsy's talking about with with those dollars. And I think we're likely, and we just have to keep fighting the good fight. Um, you know, I think when we compare to our, our neighboring state of Maine, uh, they're four times, five times the budget uh, they spend on marketing than we do. Uh, if anything, we're resting on our laurels and we need to be careful because uh, as we've seen things change in the last two years, those laurels can go away and a ski town doesn't always have to be a ski town. Uh, so, so we want to be careful there and, and put those dollars to good use. The last plug I'll put in, uh, and I've said this often even as the, the travel chair and, and before and, and with a good relationship with Commissioner Pelham on the topic, that the, the, the Vermont Department of Travel and Tourism is kind of the central hub but it's got so many good partners that it kind of trickles down which trickles down to to, to the shires of vermont brand it trickles down to okimo it trickles up to hello burlington uh some of vermont's robust marketing efforts and the reason we still have that cachet um not only because of our tourism uh, and, and the hard work they're doing but because of the partners and so when people ask me why do i give you know, membership to the Chamber of Commerce, whether that be Betsy's chamber or Matt's chamber or anybody else's chamber, um, because otherwise we, we don't have the, the, the state doesn't have the bandwidth uh, to kind of uh, promote it all. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if I, if I had one request, it would be to continue to support your regional partners. It's what we see is coming out with Stay to Stay, and I think there's going to be a, a really robust Stay to Stay program with some support. Uh, we've had those restart marketing grants that were very, that were vital. I mean, they saved uh, downtown programs. They've saved chambers from going extinct and then leveraging those dollars to get people on Main Street to go shopping uh, or to, you know, or to stay the night. Um, so again, if, if the question is, um, you know, where should I put my, my personal monies, where should I put my business monies? Remember that you've got a lot of local supporters in your downtown programs, your DMOs, uh, your chambers, and collectively together with the support of the tourism department and commissioner Pelham and her team. Uh, you know, I think, I think again, we're going to be into some very transformative things for, for Betsy, who's been at this for a while for me who, you know, now I'm getting up to the point where I've been at this for a while. Uh, it's going to be exciting uh, uh, to kind of watch. Okay, and, and we've noticed that even with the team at, at the Vermont Department of Tourism. What happens when we give them just a little bit of more money? It's, it's amazing results. So. They do well. They do well. well. Thank you both for your time today. And uh, well, and thank you all of you folks who've been uh, with us. Hope you found our program interesting. And uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, have a great day. Mm -hmm.